Hey guys, this is Toby Mathis and Jeff Webb, and you are listening to and watching, possibly, Tax Tuesday, where we bring tax knowledge to the masses, everything you could ever want. Yep. Right? Uh, welcome, and I hope you guys are having a great Tuesday. If it's not Tuesday for you, I hope you're having a great day, wherever you may be. We're going to dive right on in because we've got a lot to go through, and we're actually trying to be on time this year. I think we're doing pretty good don't give me that look i think we're doing great all right let's see who we got on here hey guys if you're willing and you're on the uh uh and you're on chat if you're willing to go to the chat just tell me where you're from raleigh new york city elam phoenix sacramento wow oh now they're flying through winston really winston say i got a bunch of properties there castle rock tyler Tyler, Texas. I blew some stuff up in Tyler, Texas. So let's see, South Florida, Houston with a client. Uh, Philly, that's my hometown. Uh, Atlanta, Honolulu, Oahu. So we've got a couple. San Luis Obispo, Austin, San Francisco Bay, Portland. Don Anacortes. Really? Anacortes, Washington? Because that's, that's actually where my mom lives. Florida, New Jersey. Iowa, Grand Rapids, we got them all over the place. Miami, San Jose, New Hampshire, uh, Queens, New York. How many of you guys can't find gas right now? Let's see, we got San Diego, Thousand Oaks, Chicago, DFW, wow, Dallas, Fort Worth. We got people from all over the place. Are you guys having any trouble? On a serious note, is anybody here having trouble finding gas? Because I, you read about it and we'll just do an informal poll here since we guys we got people on from all over the place if you're on the east coast and you're having trouble finding everybody says indiana no problem no issues nope gas is okay in texas no no gas problems california uh east coast is a problem with the colonial mm. pipeline shutdown yeah so raleigh uh raleigh has issues it filled up on saturday good in chicago over four bucks a gallon yeah so you're having people on the east coast who had some issues and i i just Hawaii and alaska are okay atlanta has some issues looking for toto and kansas not right now in chicago jersey okay it's always four dollars a gallon if you're lucky we should all just go to electric and we should all buy our cars with dogecoin all right don't give me that look either all right if anybody picks up on Mr. Musk. Uh, all right, so you can ask your questions. Uh, if you have a tax question, put it in the question and answer. Everything else, if I ask you questions, you'd answer it in chat. So let's see if you guys can figure that one out. So if you have a tax question, we have uh, tax attorney Elliot Thomas. We have Dana Cummins. We have Pio. We have Chris Cristo Zadas. We got to have a bunch of accountants on. We have four accountants on. Plus Jeff, who's a CPA, uh, and we have Patty on too. She'll 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 do that. It says I email my questions. I'm a titanium. We'll get to them. Uh, I was going to the moon, Toby, with Dogecoin. Joking. No, we could. No, I was, I sent Clint because I bought Doge when Elon Musk first cited out. I like I, he's one of the few people I follow, and I was like, oh, I'll just go buy some. And I sent Clint, it was like up 900 and some percent. And I was like, dude, you got into this, right? I was like, <laughs> then I watched Saturday Night Live and it goes, Boom. no, it's, it's actually done, doing okay. But I have no idea. I just think it's hilarious. It was never intended to be a real virtual currency. It's going to be. It was, it, was, it was created as a joke. They're realizing that if you have fiat currency, that as long as you have people believing in it, it's like a... Charlie Munger said, if people think a turd is worth something, a turd is worth something. All right. So um, send your questions in to Tax Tuesday to Anderson Advisors during the week. Shoot it on in. If you need a detailed response, like it's real specific to you, uh, we'll want you to be platinum or tax client. Otherwise, uh, we'll just answer it. And uh, gosh, we go through a lot of questions every week. And uh, I pick I mean, usually about 10 to 15 questions. Um, I'm trying to do, yeah, remember Dutch Tulip Futures, I've, I've heard that. Um, 
uh, what I try to do is grab 10 now, because if it's left up to me, we'll be here till uh, midnight. And uh, so they've asked me to make sure I only do 10 questions a session. So we'll see those questions. Because people, you know, they have lives. They don't want to sit here on taxes all day. Um, all right. Uh, I understand that if I want to set up my own qualified opportunity zone fund, it needs to be in a partnership of some kind with an LLP, LLC, C Corp, or some other entity structure. Can I form a viable partnership for this purpose with my IRA owned LLC? Good question. This is going to be fun. I'm going to test your knowledge, Jeff. I would like to make my investment condo my primary residence for tax benefits upon its sale without sleeping there 361 days over five years. Is that the only safe harbor measurement or a hard and fast rule? We'll answer that. Good questions. How can I take profits out of an S-corp without paying a lot in taxes? Good question. Kind of an open one. I like yeah. those. So I, sometimes I grab those because we could talk about those all day. Uh, how do you account for remodeling expenses versus maintenance expenses for rental property? If you mine Bitcoin, how is it taxed? That's a good question for today. Is it taxed at the price of Bitcoin minus electricity, then turned into US dollars? Good, like really good questions. Can an employer contribute to a profit sharing retirement plan if there's no profit for the year? That's, <laughs> I like those types of questions too, play on words. In my business, oh, if my business and house are in my revocable living trust when I die, what kind of tax will my kids? The beneficiaries have to pay on getting the business or the house. And then has the IRS relaxed the 750 hour requirement for real estate professional status for 2020 in light of the difficulties of the COVID pandemic? So we'll get through all those. And I can already see our guys are answering lots of questions. So go on into the Q&A feature if you have questions and uh, we'll get through those. All right, so the opening questions uh, let's let's jump into this. I understand that if I want to set up my own qualified opportunity zone fund, it needs to be in a partnership of some kind with an LLP, LLC, C Corp, or some other entity structure. Can I form a viable partnership for this purpose with my IRA owned LLC? What say you, Jeff? Um, I wasn't sure that I understood this question because Basically, there's no reason to have your IRA as part of a qualified opportunity fund that mm -hmm. I am aware of. Uh, the tax is already deferred. Uh, if you had capital gains in the IRA, they're going to be deferred until you pull that money out. So uh, I would not partner with uh, my IRA uh, for a qualified opportunity zone. So here's a little bit of a different spin on it. So uh, I like to unpack things a little bit. So the first thing we do is we go to the statute 1400Z, 26 USC 1400Z, which was uh, the qualified opportunity zones that were that came about the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. So it's the special section that if you have capital gains, you can invest them into a into a a uh, troubled area that all states have now designated certain zip codes where they where they need infusions of capital and investment. So to do that, they say, hey, you can defer your taxes and you'll get a step up in basis on a portion of those. Right now, you can get a 10% step up and you could defer it until 2026. So if I have taxes that I would owe on a transaction on capital gains, I can invest it subject to some rules in something called a qualified opportunity zone fund and defer those taxes for right now, it looks like five years, right? Then if I invest in that opportunity zone fund for a minimum of 10 years, it steps up the basis to the fair market value of those assets. In other words, you pay no tax on the capital gains. And I think that goes until uh, 2040 something, 2041 or something along those lines. So the idea is that, hey, uh, Congress creates this incentive to go into this area you don't have to pay tax right away. You can defer some of your capital gains. And then if you invest those capital gains into something and keep it there for a long time, for 10 years, then you could sell it in 20 years and pay no tax on any of those gains. 
So that's kind of the, the layout is this tax incentive area. And so what's, what, what's the issue? Like, how, how do I get in there? Well, you have to invest in a fund, which a fund has to be a partnership or a corporation for federal tax purposes. So uh, federal tax purposes is not the end all be all. States have entities like LLCs that, that don't exist in the code that you could say, hey, want an LLC taxes a corp, want an LLC taxes a partnership. That works. I want an LP tax as a partnership. That will work. I want an S corp. I want a C corp. <coughs> I want something that I can use as my fund. And then that has to invest a portion of the money. I think 90% in qualified opportunity zone property and property doesn't mean, you know, just real estate. It could be a business. It could be uh, having employees there. 50% or more of the employees are there. All that stuff starts to qualify. Then you get into all these crazy rules. So yes, so going back to the question then, yes, it has to be a partnership or corporation. Um, and can that then partner with something else? And here's the big question. Can I have non-opportunity zone monies going into an opportunity zone fund and investing in opportunity zone property? And the answer is yes. So, let, you know, if I want the benefit of a qualified opportunity zone fund, I have to have capital gains that I'm deferring. If you are in a IRA, you're not deferring anything. So it's just an investment. Okay. And so the, the weird answer is, yes, I can actually partner with an IRA, uh, with my own IRA in the initial transaction. This is where people get screwed up because they think, oh, I'm a disqualified individual. If I have an IRA, I can't do business with myself. You're correct, but setting up the business is not uh, engaging in continuous transactions. You're allowed to set it up as long as it's a one-time funding. So, uh, so like if Jeff is my 401k or IRA and I am me, we're disqualified people from each other to do continued transactions, we could set up a one-time business and he could put in half, I could put in half, whatever it is. Um, and we could go into business together. What Jeff said was absolutely 100% correct. There's no reason for the IRA to try to do a qualified opportunity zone fund. It can't because it doesn't have capital gains. But if I need the funds, could I partner with somebody who's not taking advantage of the qualified opportunity zone? Yeah. I could, we just have, we have to keep track of our different bases. We have inside basis, outside basis of the, of the deal. I mean, Jeff loves this stuff cause he's an accountant, but we just partner up together. And that's the long answer. Sorry. I saw what you did there. You, 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 you didn't assume that they knew what we were talking about with qualified <laughs> opportunity fund. I already see all the questions. <laughs> and I just up. jumped right in. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff is like, didn't, didn't some of the benefits of the qualified opportunity fund already uh, end like the 15% step up? No. So what it was, was you had a step up in basis at year five and seven. Uh, you had a 10% and a 5%. And now that we're so close to 2026, there's no seven years. So if I, if I roll some money and I don't have, I'm not going to make it seven years before it's automatic trigger of that tax. So uh, it's, it's still there. It's just unless they move the recognition date. Could you imagine somebody that deferred their tax at 20% and then they walk right into 39.6 plus 3.8. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's going to be some interesting conversations going on with accountants when they realize that you just doubled their tax. Don't anyway, you guys get that <laughs> confuse myself sometimes. Um, but anyway, that's a qualified opportunity zone. All right. Here's a good one. I would like to make my investment condo my primary residence for tax purposes upon its sale without sleeping there for 731 days over five years. Is that the only safe harbor? Is that only a safe harbor measure or a hard and fast rule? That's, yeah. that's a hard and fast rule. And you actually have two problems there. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't sleep in it at least 185 days a year, you're never going to make that your principal residence. 
uh, your principal residence is always where you spend the most time, most nights. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the one, section 121 exclusion of which what we're talking about here uh, requires it to be a, your primary residence. Uh, and then to take the 121, you have to have two years of living there out of the last five years. And mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be consecutive. So uh, yeah, it, there's no way around this unless you meet one of the exceptions for you were forced to move for work or something of that nature where you could get a reduced uh, exclusion. Yeah, this is another one of those ones where we're gonna have to step way back from it to give you guys kind of the layout of the rules, right? So I think what they're talking about is the 121 exclusion which is a capital gains only exclusion when you sell a residence that you lived in two of the last five years. So that's number one. So if you have an investment condo as you, and you make it into your primary residence and over the next five years, you live there for two of those five years and it's actually number of days. So it's 365 times two over that last five year stretch. I don't know mm -hmm. what all those things add up to be, but it's something along those lines, right? Mm -hmm. um, then you would qualify for at least a portion of the, the safe harbor. But what we're not hitting on here, and I think what they're getting at is that if you have a period of disqualified use, in other words, you invested it, it was a second home, it was not a primary residence, that those days are prorated compared to how many days you lived in it. So if I lived in it for 300, uh, 731 days, but I had it as a rental property for 731 days, then I would get one half of the exclusion because I had 50% non-qualified, 50% qualified. There's no way around that unless you fall into an exception. And the exceptions, if I remember them all correctly, number one is if it was your primary residence and you turn it into an investment property, so long as you lived in it two of the last five years before selling it, then we ignore the period of disqualified use. So if I lived in it for two years, made it into an investment property for three years and sold it right before the end of the fifth year, I would have 24 months of that 60 months that I used it as a primary residence and I would get my entire capital gain exclusion, the entire amount, which is 250,000 for an individual, 500,000 for a married couple. But remember the recapture or the unrecaptured depreciation is what technically it's called. Um, that recapture is not uh, covered by the capital gain exclusion, just the capital gains. That's number one. Number two is what Jeff said. If you have unforeseen circumstances, you could, uh, and you had a forced move, death in the family, things like that, then they could prorate it, or they may say, hey, we're not going to hold it against you, mm -hmm. that portion. The other one is if you're in military and you're actively deployed, then they say, ignore that time too. And there's one other, which is if it's a 1031 exchange, I could 1031 exchange it. I can't use my 121 exclusion for five years, but I can add my 121 to the previous basis if I do another, uh, e either the sale or the 1031 exchange. So, and, and we were just looking at that the other day about the 1031 exchange. And from what we were reading, you can't even start counting time until that five years is up. So you actually have to get to go at least seven years in that exchange property. And that's if you 1031 exchange into an investment property and then you make it your primary residence. Right. What Jeff's saying is, yeah, there, there's going to be a big section of it that, again, if it's a million dollars of gain and you're allowed two sevenths of, the, uh, of that as a capital gain exclusion, then my, my understanding is that you would take of the gain, you'd get two sevenths of it. So gosh, I used a stupid number, right? Two out of seven. So I'd, what is that? two sevenths, that crud, uh, about yeah. th some, somewhere around 30%. About yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess we go two. Seven goes into two, about three, 28 percent. All right. So somebody's helping us. 28 percent. We get a two hundred eighty thousand dollar capital gain exclusion that we should be able to use. It's kind of a goofy rule. But for this case, I started out at an investment property. I turned it into a primary residence. I have two areas that I have to be careful of. Disqualified use. And I have the, uh, the recapture that are not part of it. So in other words, you got to talk to your accountant before you sell and know the numbers before you pull the trigger. Don't just say, oh, I don't have to pay it. Jump into something else. Oh, come join us. As always, we do the Infinity Investing Workshop. They're free. We have another one coming up on the 15th, which is that, is that this weekend? Yeah, four days away. Come join us. Uh, you can, it's absolutely free. ABA.link forward slash IIW. If you've never been to an Infinity Investing Workshop, you're in for a treat. Uh, we have a lot of fun going over stocks and real estate and everything is designed around cash flow. An asset, something that puts money in your pocket, a liability is something that takes it out so we don't fall for all the shenanigans that those financial people like to, to sell us. You don't do the too good to be true. And Dogecoin is not an asset, guys. Dogecoin is a cash or cash equivalent. You'll learn all this fun stuff. So like, if you want to invest and uh, speculate in currencies or virtual currencies or whatever they may be, that's like 1% to 3% of your assets. It's a small little sliver. Still kind of fun though when they go crazy. Um, questions. I'm going to see if there's any questions popping around out there. Somebody says clarification. We never allow a MF deal sponsor, a GP of a multifamily syndication to use an IRA on his own deal. Are we wrong? Technically, if they're going to be involved in the transaction, you might have an issue, right? So, it, but if, if, uh, the GP is involved, technically you possibly could, um, but I, I, I wouldn't agree. I, I wouldn't because they're getting paid on it. So I'd, I'd actually say if they're a GP, no, if it's somebody who's investing their own money and some IRA money that I wouldn't really care, but if they're going to be involved in continuous transactions, they'd be a disqualified party. And I'd be on the safe side of that one, even partnering with your IRA. Like this is what people do. They go into investment property. I can't go pick up a hammer and work on that property. I would violate and I would disqualify my IRA. The other thing is we use the term IRA on those deals. I would be using a 401k because IRAs, if there's any debt on it, you're going to have unrelated debt financed income flowing into the IRA. And I'd prefer not to have that. If 401k is not subject to the same rules, they don't have unrelated debt finance income. So you're much better off if you're going to have IRAs in a syndication is to tell them to roll it into a solo 401k. If they don't have one, we could set that up for them. And it's going to avoid a couple of things. The custodial fees, you're not going to have to worry about somebody else signing on the, on the syndication documents. They can sign themselves. And uh, you don't have to worry about UDFI. Uh, I put $500 into crypto that is now worth $16,000. How is that treated from tax? The year it went up or the time you take the money out? It's the, it's the time you take the money out. So cryptocurrencies are treated as a capital asset. So pretend that stock. So Heather, uh, let's say that you put $500 into uh, Ethereum and it's now worth 16,000. Until you sell it, there's no tax. And here's a hint. The rich folks, they don't sell their crypto. They put it into an account and borrow against it because it is not taxable. The day you sell it is the day you pay the tax or it's the day that it's a taxable event. Kind of fun. Kind of. Kind of. All right. How can I take the profits out of an S Corp without paying a lot in taxes? Jeff. Well, the way an S Corp works is you are, say you're the 100% shareholder of that S Corporation. Mm -hmm. Whatever profit that S Corporation has, that's your income and you pay tax on that income, regardless of whether you take money out of the S Corporation or not. And we see, sometimes see this as a problem with growing S corporations when they're making a lot of money, but they're reinvesting that money into the S corporation is 
uh, sometimes the owners get saddled with a big tax bill that they haven't considered taking money out for. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's say you had a small profit in the current year and you took out all your past year's profits. Uh, you're only going to be taxed on the current year profit, not what you actually took out of the company. Mm -hmm. I think what Jeff's saying is it doesn't matter whether you take the money out of the S Corp or not. Did I say that? Um, kind of. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's because it's just being, you're being, you're paying tax on the profit no matter what. And if there is no profit and you're taking money out, the only time you have to be scared, right? Is if you, if, if you take more cash out. And you have invested. Yeah. Then you have basis and uh, what well, you have invested use English, right? Um, everybody's asking, how do you borrow against crypto? It is <laughs> we'll get to all that guys. We have some crypto questions coming up. And uh, yeah, there's, there's places, I forget which one. Uh, hey, Patty, can you see what, I forget what Grant, he had, he had one that he thought was pretty good that he uses. Um, but anyway, well, Nexo, somebody's saying Nexo, Nexo Bank. There's, yeah, there, there's another one too that's pretty good that we've seen. But yeah, you can, you can borrow against it. They'll pay you a pretty good interest too. I mean, excuse me, you could borrow against it and pay, but uh, other places will actually uh, pay you, um, on your crypto will pay you an interest rate if you let them use it. Um, kind of like a bank, right? Uh, how can I take, well, okay. So, so we know that we don't get, we whether we take the money out of the S Corp is immaterial. So if I wanna take profits out, then I don't wanna pay a bunch of withholding, then I would take it out as a, as a distribution. If I had a bunch of income and I don't wanna pay tax on it, period, I might set up a 401k and defer my salary and run it through payroll and defer up to, if I'm under 50, 19,500 this year. Mm -hmm. If I'm over 50, another 6,500. And that's deferred, plus the company could match 25% if you have a solo 401k. Right. And uh, the other fun one is if you have anything that's a flow through, just remember the earnings. Um, it doesn't have to, much to do with the amount of cash that you have. So like I could buy a piece of equipment and finance it and come out of pocket, nothing. Uh, I've done this with like, you know, copy machines. Think of when you do one of those really long leases with the dollar payoff, it's called a capitalized lease and you can actually deduct it in the year that you, you acquire it uh, as a uh, under either 168 or 179. Uh, so you get this huge loss in, in one year but you may have a bunch of cash. Well, they're, yay, you know, but again, you have that basis. Um, did you want anything else to add on to nope. that one? And if you have S Corp and you're taking out distributions, just remember if you have profit, you should be taking a reasonable salary. Uh, lots of questions popping up on, you guys are, everybody's crypto crazy right now. I'm gonna coin that term. Crypto crazy? No, no pun intended, you get it? I'm gonna coin. It's pretty funny. Uh, I think it's funny. Nobody else. Can you define reasonable salary? Uh, -uh. neither can the IRS. <laughs> There's just like this, all these crazy. Somebody says, can you define reasonable salary? I say it's about a, what, about a third. Yeah, what they say is reasonable salary is what you would objectively pay somebody else to do the same work that you're doing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nobody knows. The courts always just say a third. Yeah, like so the accountant that took 200 he made 200,000 out of an S corp didn't take a salary. Well, going back to your point about I, I, I could pay myself $20,000 a year put defer almost all of it into 401k mm -hmm. and have almost no taxable income coming out of that. That's what we like. I like it when we defer. We have folks putting uh what's the biggest one we have in a defined benefit plan? I know we have a we have we have some folks putting six seven hundred thousand dollars a year into a defined yeah. benefit plan. Um, don't yeah, so they don't pay any tax, but yet they will pay tax eventually when they're forced to take it out of the out of the retirement plan. But we're deferring a lot now, and usually it's because they don't need the money. Uh, somebody says, "How do you determine if the salary the salary if money is being invested back into the S corp?" Well, here's the thing. If you don't take a distribution out, you don't have to take a reasonable salary. So if all the money's staying in the S Corp, you don't have to take a salary. It's only if you're taking distributions. 
S-Corps. And that's the actual rule. So a lot of people say, well, if your S-Corp shows a profit, you have to take a salary. That is not true. Right. It's only true if you make a if, if, if you make a salary and you take distributions. Somebody just says, I love defined benefit plans. I'm putting in about $400,000 a year since I'm in my 60s. See, that's, I think it's a star. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what you do. It's a big makeup. If you don't know what they are, come to a couple of our events. Um, we'd love to explain them to you. <laughs> they're, they're fun. Look at all these questions all of a sudden. It's probably all crypto. <laughs> All right, how do I account for remodeling expenses versus maintenance expenses for a rental property? Uh, the simple answer is maintenance expenses or repairs are expenses for keeping the asset at its current value. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're talking about remodeling, you're talking about a couple of things. You're talking about improvements and is it a renovation uh, where you're adding to it? Is it a... Uh, uh, a betterment where you're increasing the value of the asset mm -hmm. and so forth. And, and you have to watch some of them because uh, let's say you bought a house for hundred thousand dollars. You didn't really take care of it. Uh, you had to do some re remediation because the foundation was sinking or whatever. Uh, the, that's probably going to be a betterment. That's going to be a betterment because mm -hmm. uh, in any type of deterioration over time that you repair later, repair later, uh, that's going to be a betterment. That's not a repair anymore. There's the tangible property regs that have a few other little caveats in there. If you're spending more than like, uh, gosh, I'm not going to pretend like I know all the different rules, but it, it depends on if you're going into a particular area and you're not improving more than 30% of its total value. Like, so like the example that I've, I've heard is if you're doing AC units, don't replace them all at once. But if you mm -hmm. go and fix one at a time, if you have like five, different units you can expense them uh the other thing is remember that an expense is i mean that all that's doing is offsetting uh your income and for the most part if we really want to uh create a loss in real estate it's easy to do with the cost segregation so i don't see a lot of the maintenance versus remodeling stuff coming up anymore right it was big a few years back before the cost segregation uh, or excuse me, before the 168 bonus depreciation, which was under the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. So uh, before uh, 2017, it was a much bigger deal. And you do have this safe harbor of a $2,500 invoice that's automatically, if you choose to treat it as a, a re as a repair, it's immediately deductible. A betterment gets stretched out over the life of the asset. So on a traditional single family residence, for example, the best example I can give you is if you went and you replaced a roof, that would be stretched out over a 27 and a half year period. You'd retire the old roof, whatever value you hadn't taken, you, you would take a deduction for that entire amount. So if the roof was 20,000 bucks and you depreciated half of it, you get a $10,000 deduction. You put the new roof up at let's say 20 grand and you'd take that 20,000, you'd start stretching it out over 27 and a half years again. If I just repaired the roof, let's say I did $2,500 with a repair, and I said, hey, I don't care what it is. I'm just going to expense it. You would just write off $2,500 that year, which is going to lower your taxable income. Most people that have rentals have more depreciation than they have income. Just my experience, mm -hmm. like because we can accelerate it. We could accelerate all of the five, seven, and 15-year property into one year if we want to. Uh, you know, The old rule is if you're paying taxes and you have real estate, you just don't own enough, right? Um, we, we see a lot of people who will, will, will go in and, well, I had to update my kitchen and bathrooms. Uh, and that seems like a great time to do that cost segregation on that renovation because there is a lot of short term, five, seven, and all of the stuff you're putting in probably, a bathroom is yeah. pretty much it because you're putting in the cabinets and the, the tile and the, the fixtures and the glass and the mirrors and the light fixtures. Uh, like, what if the HVAC goes? What, how do you treat betterment? I mean, a, a betterment is treated as a as that asset. So, if it's non-residential real estate, it's thirty-nine year property. If it's residential real estate, it is twenty-seven and a half year. Mm -hmm. As as a matter of course, you could elect to change that treatment 
And then they would say, what type of asset is it? Is it a five, seven or 15 year property or is it part of the structure? So it depend. You put a new appliance into a rental, that's going to be five year property. You're going to do that bonus depreciation and write it all off in that year. Yeah. 168 lets us write anything less than 20 years. We can write off in one year if we want. Put in a pool, it's 15 year property. So you could write it all off in one year, right? But yeah, you'd have to do the cost segregation, right? I think something like that, that was so uh, determinant that you were installing a pool would probably okay. stand on its own. You could probably do that. But if you're buying a property, you're going to have a little If you're trouble. buying a property with a pool, you're going to need to mm-hmm. segregate all those costs. Somebody says, I have three different businesses. Two of them are now making money. Congratulations. How would I pay myself? Should I have them all report to my S Corp and pay myself for my taxes from there? So great question. A lot of times what I do is I have a single parent that runs the different companies. Like if I have three different active businesses, I'll have one main parent that's usually an S Corp and then it'll own either disregarded entities or what's called a Q sub, which is a qualified S subsidiary. And the reason that I do that is so I only have one tax return Mm -hmm. so that if two are making money and one's losing, they offset each other. It's treated as one activity. Do you re- recommend a resource on cost segregation company? Yeah. Uh, Eric Oliver at Cost Seg Authority is really good. We have some others too, but um, we do a lot with Eric. Yeah. Somebody says, what about flooring? Flooring would generally be what five-year property. Yeah. If it's, uh, and that's a good point. If it's carpet or interior paint, that's always deductible in the year of replacement. Yep. Uh, can you use bonus depreciation for it? Yeah. Uh, Somebody says, sorry, if you did not catch my I'm, I'm just saying that GPs and private placements neglect to mention UDFI so that they can get folks to invest. Yes, yeah, you're right, Charles. They, they notify you on your K-1. Yeah, they, we're, <laughs> we're very much aware. <laughs> let's say that. Uh, let's see. Somebody says, what if you have to reline your sewer to a rental? How would you handle that? Partial cost in backyard would be about 6K. In front of the city line would be about 8K. What would you do on that? Uh, I would probably treat it as an improvement, but I'd also probably treat it as 15-year property. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when you have uh, uh, sewer lines, well, I guess there's there's two types. There's specialized plumbing, and then there's ordinary plumbing. The ordinary plumbing might be part of the entire the foundational issue. Mm-hmm. So I'm not I'm, I, I'm not just sitting here. I wouldn't know, but. Yeah, I think once it gets inside your house, it becomes structural and uh, and it's the 27 and a half year property. Then, so it sounds like on those, you might be able to accelerate it into one year if you want to take the big one. Uh, does $2,500 maintenance per year per repair? Per repair per items. Like, so you can't have three roof repairs for $2,500 each. You could have a roof repair for $2,500, a siding repair for $2,500, the sidewalk repair. What is bonus depreciation in the context of real estate? Um, bonus just depreciation is 168K, so 26 USC 168K. And all it's saying is anything that's less than 20 year property, you could elect to treat it as uh, one year. You can bonus it all into one year. And it doesn't have to be the year you put it into service. So in real estate, it means I look at a big structure. So like Jeff and I are in a studio here in a commercial building. This is 39 year property, but the carpet underneath us and the tiles on the walls and the tiles in the ceiling and the light fixtures, those are a combination of five, seven and 15 year property. So what a cost segregation is, is you change your uh, uh, accounting uh, uh, treatment. So it's 3115 that you file with your 10, 1040 or 1065. And you say, I'm going to treat this building as not just uh, structural real estate, I'm going to break it down into something called 1250 and 1245 uh, property, the 1245 property being personal property. So like this carpet, we know this carpet's not going to make it 39 years. Mm-hmm. So we're going to treat it as five-year property. And then you could bonus that. Boom. So if this building is worth, this building here is probably about 15 million uh, and the carpet in it might be worth a million. No, it's not that. Maybe Gosh, uh, 250,000 is probably okay. more along the, the, the flooring. It just means that I could take a $250,000 deduction in year one. 
Uh, anyway. Yeah, I, I did a cost segregation a number of years ago for a structure that was a freezer warehouse for a food manufacturer. Mm -hmm. Um, mm. And the cost was so much, and we ended up segregating so much of the cost into the freezer capabilities mm -hmm. that very little of the cost was left in the warehouse. So you know where we see that we had a guy buy a mobile home park oh, that yeah. had all the fixtures, and he thought on a, like I, I remember that because it was it was Eric at uh, Costseg, and they thought it would be like a hundred and thirty thousand dollars is what they were looking at it when they actually went out and the engineers went out, it was a million plus on the personal property versus about $200,000 on the land. Mm -hmm. They got a massive, massive deduction. And uh, I'm sure I'm a little bit off on those numbers, but it's pretty darn close. It's, 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 uh, it's pretty freakish. All right. Everybody wants to know about, uh, everybody wants to know about Bitcoin. Uh, okay. One quick question. What is 15 year property 20 year? All property has a lifespan according to the IRS. And they put it on a schedule. So a car is five-year property. An airplane is seven-year property. Carpet is five-year. Appliances are, what are they? <laughs> I don't know. Five-year for a rental. Five-year for a rental. Cabinets are seven-year property. Um, HVAC, God knows. It's an HVAC. Um, yeah, anyway, so you have, what it just means is that if I, if I paid a dollar for it and it's five-year property it means i write off 20 cents a year unless there's some other um rule somebody says i thought you could expense repairs up to five thousand dollars is it only 2500 there's two safe harbors so you're, you're you're referring to a different safe harbor i think Pio's already answering us i'll let him do it so the easiest one for me to remember is 2500 there's another one there's another one that I want to say is 10% of the property value up to, up to. ten thousand dollars. Yeah, there's there's some funky ones. And they might be confusing it with that the old uh before it was twenty five hundred dollars, it used to only be five hundred. Five hundred. Well, so isn't that fun? <laughs> we'll just keep guessing at what you were thinking. <laughs> All right. If you mine Bitcoin, how is it taxed? Is it taxed at the coin of Bitcoin minus electricity, then turned into US dollars? All right. Do you want to do this one? Yeah, or? I'll do this one. All right. So when you mine Bitcoin or any other currency that does mining or staking for some of the other coins, uh, when you create a coin, um, that whatever it is worth at the time you create it, that is your income in that coin. So right now, Bitcoin, I think it's trading about 56 grand. Uh, so if you did the work to create the Bitcoin, you'd have uh, income of 56,000. Yeah. So the, so the create, it is that active income. That is ordinary income. That mm -hmm. is not capital gain income. And that's going to be taxed as. At your ordinary rates. If you're in the top bracket, it's going to be 37%. And plus, and it's subject to self-employment tax. It is subject to self-employment tax. All right. We haven't sold it yet. No, nope. but let's say that we create it and you created it at X dollars and then you sell it a year later. For X plus Y. Mm -hmm. So if X, let's just say this is 56K and we sell it for 100K, that means that Y is what, 44,000? Mm -hmm. That would be taxed as how? Capital gains. This would be long term capital gains. So long-term capital gains means it's taxed at either 0, 15, or 20% less, um, less Biden at all change that. So in the second part of the question about uh, deductions, uh, mm -hmm. yes, you can deduct your cost of goods sold or any other business expenses. We know electricity is a huge expense. Mm -hmm. I, I've heard that the cost, the electrical cost of uh, Virtual currency is greater than the electrical costs in some developed countries. So yeah, they're uh, really yeah. That's that's the big problem. Um, so creation minus expenses equals your your total tax. So the the problem that we always have with miners is they're mining coins all the time, and like they're just give you an idea. There's there's five billion Doge coins mined every year. There's I don't know the total number of Bitcoin right now. Um, I know they got a market cap in the trillions. So right, well, there's going to be a total of 21 million Bitcoin total once it's done, 
in about another hundred years. Uh, but what they do is they have a difficulty equation. So there's less and less being mined every day. So every 10 minutes, it's like 6.25. So I'd have to figure out what that adds up to. Um, and I think I saw the cost of electricity was about five to $10,000 per coin. It's kind of like oil and that it, sometimes it's not worth it. So a lot of the mining operations are saying, hey, it's getting too difficult. Okay, that's good. That means that there's, there's more scarcity and until mm-hmm. it goes up in value. So if Bitcoin was worth $560,000 a coin, they'd probably be doing it. So eventually that difficulty equation is going to make it worth it. Um, so you have the creation on a daily basis. And on some of these cases, you have these little machines and they're mining 20 or 30 coins a day of a different type of uh, currency. And so from the accounting standpoint, I'm just telling you, it's a pain in the katush because you have to figure out what those coins were, the value was. Uh, generally, would you use the close of business? Or would uh, you-, you would probably do a midday or something like that. Isn't that crazy? Average. It's like, just think about this. You make a coin, you're going to have to go look and say, oh, what, what, what's this one at? And one of the things we never hear people, we hear people talk about investing in virtual currency or mining crypto but they don't talk about the ones that are using it for business expenses and stuff like that well this is a good thing so when i put sell that equals sell or exchange which means i use a bitcoin to buy a tesla because you can buy teslas with bitcoin now so let's say i take one of my coins and it's worth sixty thousand. I mined it at 10,000. So I have $10,000 of basis. Um, It's now worth 60 and I buy a a Tesla with it. What I really did is I sold my Bitcoin at 60. I would have capital gains for that difference between what I mined it at and what I exchanged it at. Mm -hmm. And I would owe tax on that $50,000 a gain, which would be either short-term or long-term, depending on how, how, how long I held it. Yeah. Going back to what you're saying, though, I think one of the biggest difficulties we see with miners and even traders of crypto is really bad record keeping. It's it's really difficult. And a lot of these guys are kind of off the beaten path anyway. They're, mm-hmm. just, they're like, hey, how, how's anybody going to know? Well, and until they start digging, nobody does. Uh, and somebody says, why are you taxed on creation? Isn't that your investment? Uh, well, kind of think of it like this way. If you bought a share of Microsoft for a hundred bucks, you had to generate the hundred bucks. So when you mine, and you, let's say you mined a share of Microsoft, they're gonna say you mined a hundred bucks. So it's not an investment because you never got taxed. On an investment, I paid tax on the monies that I used. It was after tax monies on an investment. Or somebody asked whether you could do this in an IRA. You can own Bitcoin in an IRA for the most part, but you can't uh, mine it because mining is an active uh, uh, activity, which would be unrelated, uh, uh, UBIT, unrelated business taxable income. I, I will agree that this, the way they're taxing the creation is a bit unusual, uh, but this is, crypto is probably the most tested uh, issue by IRS. Mm-hmm. Actually, there is now, as of the 2020, a question on the 1040 of, are you investing in crypto? Like, they have an information sharing agreement with Coinbase, which just went public two weeks ago. Uh, they're going to, you know, and that's a public wallet. So if you like, if you really want to get into crypto, join us at one of the infinities. We'll get it. We'll, we'll do a deep dive for you. But in a real nutshell is you have public wallets and you have private. A public is where somebody else is holding your Bitcoin for you. It's really not in your possession, and that's a Coinbase. And then you have the private wallet, like eWallet and some of these others, where you could actually download it and you carry it around with you. And it has a, it has either a phrase code or it has a, a password on it, or both. And uh, so that if you lose the device, you can still recover it. But if somebody has your device, they don't owe your, they don't own the coins. They'd have to be able to get into it. And how much is the duck? deductible if somebody steals your virtual currency um you'd have a loss but it's zero it's zero you cannot so if somebody steals your wallet and takes your coins you're out Mm -hmm. of luck Mm. 
What if you mined it and then it got disappeared? I don't know. I, Couldn't you have a business loss at that point? I could see you having a business loss at that point. It seems like it would be a capital loss, but hmm. no, I don't know. It's uh it's it's a brave new world, right? It's uh, out there. All right. I'm kind of finding I, I have a Coinbase account and I'm kind of finding it's more akin to gambling than investing. <laughs> you don't think that invest like yeah, it's 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 not a it's not stock and it's not paying you anything. It is pure unadulterated hedging against the dollar because you're ticked off at dollars. Mark Cuban and uh, Elon Musk said, "Hey, we're going to take Dogecoin," and uh, SpaceX is paying for the entire uh, exhibition to um, the moon in Dogecoin. So, I think that's pretty funny. <laughs> They're like basically saying, "Hey, central banks." <laughs> yeah read between the lines uh all right can an employer contribute to a profit sharing retirement plan if there's no profit for the year oh we've been looking forward to this one uh we call them profit sharing plans but they go by other names too and it really has nothing to do with your profit it's just helpful if you have profit that so you can pay these contributions uh you can create a loss though with it yeah, you can certainly create a loss when we have that happen. Uh, uh, it sounds like you have to have profit because you're sharing the profit. But like I said, having money and taxable income, two very different things. Yeah. I could have lots of taxable income and no cash. I could have lots of cash and no taxable income. Right. We can make the uh, we can make most 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 uh, businesses we can make the numbers dance a little bit. So yeah, the only requirement here is that your employee or employees have compensation that you can base that profit sharing on. Hmm. Oh gosh, we have so many questions coming up. Here's one. Uh, I am confused between bonus depreciation versus cost segregation versus the $2,500 write-off. If I have a rental and want to cost segregate, the well, it just disappeared. The appliance, can I write, up, write, write it off in the entire year in year one? So if it's an appliance, can they just write it off? uh no you can write it off under bonus depreciation uh bonus it's, depreciation is a tool that is used along with cost segregation mm -hmm. uh, so if we didn't have bonus depreciation cost segregation wouldn't mean a whole lot uh might mean shorter depreciation lives but not the big write-offs that we're typically seeing mm -hmm. so you know so i guess the easiest way to look at it is the $2,500 is pure repair that has nothing to do with personal property. Uh, it has to do with, did I improve a piece of, re uh, of, of real estate structure? So that's always the 27 and a half in, thir in 39 mm -hmm. year. When you get into personal property, bonus de depreciation is just a fancy way of saying, I don't want to write it off on the normal schedule of five, seven, or 15 years. I want to write it off right now. Can you effectuate a sale of property with Bitcoin? How does this affect taxes? Yeah, you absolutely can. Um, more and more, like Visa is now going to start allowing you to settle up with Bitcoin. There are NFL athletes being paid in Bitcoin or a portion of their salaries being paid in Bitcoin. But remember, when I receive something of value, so let's say this remote here is worth 10 bucks, and Jeff says, I will do services for you for this remote. $10 taxable to Jeff, because that's what that value is. If this value is a hundred bucks and we just say, I want the remote hundred dollars taxable. How do we know what the value of this is? They have exchanges where they say what the value is on a daily basis. So I could choose, so I could say, Hey, I will do work for one Bitcoin and I work my tush off and the Bitcoin is worth $6. I have a taxable event of $6. If it's 60,000, I have a taxable event of 60,000. Same thing with mining. Um, and then somebody says, how, how can you determine your basis if untraceable date of mining, assuming you put it in a, in a, uh, a, a private wallet? It's really tough for them to, to find out. You know, It's the same thing as if I took cash for services. How does the IRS know? Well, they don't. It's, it's just, it's a crime. That's all. The consequences are dire mm -hmm. if they catch you. Yeah, they're going to, they'll prosecute you. They'll make a, a, a case at you. The special agents that carry guns will show up at your house. <laughs> Stop that. You're going to scare everybody. Um, 
What is the depreciation of solar panels? Uh, Five-year property, right? Yes. Uh, so solar panels are weird in that you get a tax credit if you install solar panels on a property and it's if it's if it's rental property for example you're not the user mm -hmm. you get a 26 percent tax credit and then you reduce the depreciable basis by one half of the tax credit so if i put a ten thousand dollar solar array on a on a on a rental i'd get a twenty six hundred dollar tax credit not a not a deduction i'd get a tax credit to apply dollar for dollar and then I would take half of that 1300 and subtract it off the 10,000. And I would get a deduction for $8,700, which I could choose to depreciate it in one year and take the whole $8,700, or I could stretch it out over five years. Um, if you are putting a solar array on your personal home, different rules, it's just a tax credit. You get a 26% tax credit. Um, anyway, fun stuff. Oh, look, you can go on to social media and follow us. So we got all these people going to the moon. See, the Doge, the Doge people are out there, little Shiba Inus. I like cats, but I can, I can, the Shiba Inus are essentially dogs that act like cats, I think. I must have one of those. Hmm? I must have one of those. You have a dog that acts like a yeah. cat? Does it meow? No, it just whines a lot. Whines. <laughs> Cats don't whine. I have fuzzy cats that just look at you with big eyes. They don't even meow. It's kind of disconcerting. You wake up in the middle of the night and you just got eyes like they're just waiting for you to die so they can eat your eyeballs. All right. Something like that. Yeah. Morbid but we don't thoughts. Want to scare Morbid right. thoughts. We don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, is it, is it breathing? Yeah. Um, if my business and house are in my revocable living trust when I die, what kind of tax will my kids, the beneficiaries, have to pay on getting the business or the house? Hey, I'm going to take a page out of your book and explain how revocable mm -hmm. living trusts work. So when you have a revocable living trust, you can always change that until the day you die. Mm -hmm. uh, you put assets in it and you can change those assets. You can take it back out, whatever. Uh, but once you die whatever the living trust says happens next. And it's usually, it's going to go into an irrevocable trust. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be the pour over trust with the uh, spousal side. And so there's a portion of the assets that could end up in an irrevocable trust when somebody dies. Assume that both parents have passed and it's going to, and it's going to the kids. Go ahead. Well, no, I'm, sorry, I'm asking you. No, oh, yeah. oh, okay. That was a question. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've died and I have all these assets in my uh, trust and my revocable trust. Well, mm -hmm. now I have an irrevocable trust. Yep. Everything gets dumped into there mm -hmm. at the stepped up basis, correct? Well, it wouldn't be the, yeah. You, you From know, the you, revocable you, trust to the. So you'd have when, when somebody passes, you're going to have a step up a basis correct. and it's going to go in the trust. Taxable the beneficiaries or taxable the trust if it doesn't distribute the asset, right? So the beneficiaries are never going to pay tax on an inheritance or a gift or anything like that. Uh, at worst, if uh, you currently have more than eleven half million dollars worth of assets, uh, your estate may pay a trust, uh, pay a tax. There's a, I think, four or five states with an inheritance tax, mm. and they mo they usually exclude biological children and spouses, but. Um, so the, the, basically there's three types of taxes that the individuals who receive could be looking at. They could be looking at an inheritance tax. Yeah. They could be looking at a state, a state tax. Like in Oregon, there's only a million dollar exclusion on the federal side. There's a, a $11.8 million exclusion. And then there's the federal. And we, we focus a lot on the federal because it's the big hammer. It's, it's 40%. So as long as you're below that, uh, people are like, oh, phew, but you could still get hit with 11% tax out of a state. You could still get hit with an inheritance tax. There's not too many states with an inheritance tax anymore because they're that's kind of evil. I could see them coming back if they don't mess with the estate tax exclusion. Right, right now, the proposal is to, is to lower that estate tax mm -hmm. exclusion at some point. I don't think it's in the 
America's uh, American Families uh, Act, but I believe that they're looking at lowering it to five million or thereabouts so that we could get hit. But Jeff is absolutely right that the basis of the company, so there's no gain. So let's say that I have a, a house. So they have a house. Let's say it's worth um, $5 million. And mom and dad paid half a million dollars for it, you know, 30 years ago. It's in the Bay Area. The type of things you have to worry about is number one, capital gains on that. It steps up. They're trying to limit it to a million dollars. The step up, I believe, is what they're trying to do. So they're trying to say, hey, if you have that scenario, half a million dollar basis, $5 million, you would only have $1.5 million of excludable uh, basis from, from the tax. So you'd end up with $3.5 million of taxable gain if you sold it. You also have this state. So in California, for example, if they choose, well, even if they choose to live in it, I think that uh, they only have a million dollar exclusion. You'd have the increase in the um, real estate taxes. Mm -hmm. um, you'd have the federal tax. You'd look at the entire estate and say, how much was transferred if it's below 11 million per spouse? Uh, so if it's less than 22 million, you're not going to have to worry about that. California uh, mirrors the federal from a state estate tax. So you don't have to worry about that. And there's no inheritance tax. So you're kind of looking at those things as a checklist. You move that same situation into another state. Let's say it's Washington. And Washington is right around $2 million state estate tax exclusion. So same scenario, $5 million goes to kids. You're still going to get hit with the, with the real estate tax, but you, you always have. Like mom and dad had increases too. Um, you'd, it, it, same situation of where you'd have the capital gain exclusion. Right now it's unlimited, but... If, if the American Families Act came in, you'd have a million uh, dollar limitation. You have a state estate tax exclusion of around 2.1, 2.2 million, I believe, although they may change that. I believe that there's it's possibility they're going to mirror the federal, but there'd be the, the state estate tax. And then we'd have the federal again that we look at. And Washington has no inheritance tax. Every little bit's different. We take that same scenario and we put it in New Jersey and you're screwed. I'm just kidding. Uh, no, there's there you, again. You you have different rules in every jurisdiction, and it's just front. You know, I, I wish there was universal, so you'd know. Uh, somebody says once it's converted into a revocable or irrevocable trust, you have to file a ten forty one. Oh, I was going to get to that. Good question. Mm -hmm. So as long as the assets are in the trust, that trust will have to pay. Uh, file ten forty one. File mm -hmm. tax return and pay taxes on any income that they're not distributing directly to the beneficiaries. Once you've dispersed those assets to the beneficiaries and the trust shuts down and mm -hmm. so forth. Um, now, one thing with a trust, uh, you may wanna keep assets in there cause you may have young beneficiaries or things of that nature. Uh, but the trust tax brackets are very high. Yep. Uh, you wanna distribute the assets. Yeah. Yeah, somebody says, I was told a trust pays 35% tax. Could you explain that? It's actually 37, is yeah, it's, it's 37. Yeah. Right so, and, and, and it's because after $11,000, yeah, income, it's like 12,000 really or something. They max out their mm -hmm. brackets really quickly. They have a standard deduction, a small amount, $100. Yeah, it's really low. And then it's, yeah, it's kind of goofy. Um, somebody says, if the husband dies, does the wife have to file an estate tax form? For him. So husband dies, you have to do an estate tax. So if their estate is less than a half a million dollars, you do not have to file it. A reason you may want to is to get the, what they call the portability. That is, if I have a, a state of 65 or 6.5 million, uh, I, my wife may want to file an estate tax return because that 5 million I didn't use, she can now use. And so there's a, there's actually a question here that says, my husband passed away. I'm sorry to hear that, by the way. And our properties were deeded one half to his trust and one half to my trust. Can his one half be signed off to go into my trust? Now, it, once, once somebody passes, their trust becomes irrevocable and you have to follow that trust. You could, if there's a mistake that was made and the beneficiaries don't object, you could potentially decant it into a new trust to rewrite it. But for the most part, usually if it's a, it's a husband and spouse, mm -hmm. husband, wife, um, 
the spouse that the decedent is what we call their trust is now for the benefit of the surviving spouse during that surviving spouse lifetime. And they have the right to access the trust, assuming that they don't have enough in theirs. So the reason that we do this is let's say that I'm married and I have three kids and my spouse has three kids. We get together and we have six kids together, right? Three, three from each marriage. And I pass away. I don't want my spouse to rewrite that and, and, and disinherit my three kids, right? On the same token, I don't want my my surviving spouse to use up mine to disinherit my three kids and then leave hers to her three kids. Or to put it in another way, let's say that we had three kids together and I wanted my estate to go to my spouse and then to my kids and my spouse gets remarried to a, uh, to a new person who has 16 kids, right? Or whatever. And uh, we'll just make it one child. So the golden child. So they get remarried and that spouse starts saying, hey, you know, same scenario. Now surviving spouse passes new spouse would be the beneficiary. And if they could change it, they could just leave everything to their one child and we just inherited our kids. So when there's two trusts, the whole idea is that one becomes irrevocable and you have to follow it. And that's so you don't have shenanigans. And uh, if you don't think there's shenanigans, uh, what was the gal that married the 90 year old, the playmate, Anna Nicole Smith, just go, just go Google Anna Nicole Smith. She married a guy at 90 years old when she was 28 as a playboy model. So got one more question about taxes. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's say my assets are $5 million. I die mm -hmm. and uh, assets go to my kids. Are there going to be transfer taxes involved? So you die mm -hmm. and the asset goes to your children. Yes. Uh, it depends on your county. On the jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, I would say there might be a small transfer tax with a new beneficiary. But um, I mean, it just really depends county to county. Okay, but I, I, I would I would I would believe so unless you have the property, let's say it's in an LLC or something, and then nobody's going to know. If you have a greater than fifty percent change, there may be a requirement that you're supposed to, but most people don't uh, notify the county. All right, jump on to another because I know we're a little bit over. Has the IRS relaxed the seven hundred fifty hour requirement for real estate professional status in twenty twenty, in light of the difficulties of the Corbin, I screwed that up. COVID pandemic. What's the Corbin pandemic? Corbin. I, 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 we have a new pandemic. You guys were unaware of the Corbin. No, there's been no change to these rules since I think they were created in 87. Yeah, just remember that the 750 hours, uh, this rule comes out of uh, 26 USC 469C7, which is um, half of my time and 750 hours has to be on real estate activities, which could be construction, uh, development, the sale, and not just on mine, anything I do. It's where the, my, the, the majority of my personal services comes from. So if COVID has affected you, you may actually qualify now for the 750 hours and greater than one half because you're spending more time looking at real estate and I'm not spending as much time at work mm -hmm. because maybe I wasn't working. So I can be a real estate professional now, whereas no, ordinarily, if I was working too much, I couldn't. Yeah, this would be very hard to justify because real estate is booming. Uh, people are going crazy in real estate, buying mm -hmm. investment properties and so forth. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there would be a good argument for this. Yeah, for lowering it? Yeah. No, and all it does is it takes passive losses and makes them active or ordinary to be more precise. Um, book, book, uh, let's just act like a geek, go to Amazon. And it, so, uh, infinity investing came out on April 13th. It's doing pretty well. Number one release in financial services. That does not mean that it's selling millions of copies. It's selling thousands and we're on a second, uh, printing, which is good. Um, so what's that the strikeout even looks on, uh, looks like a crow. You guys are just mean, Everybody's doing the crows. Um, all right. 
So how the rich get rich, Richard, how you can do the same. So we published this. It's doing fantastic. Uh, if you feel like getting it, I would encourage you to do so and share it with somebody. Uh, it's a lot of fun and it'll help them not do bad things in the, in the markets and actually be pretty reasonable about generating wealth. We just steal all of our really successful clients' ideas and put them into a book form. So we say, hey, who's making money? How do they do it? And they keep doing the same things over and over again. Pop in there, uh, get it on Amazon. And if you do, please make sure that you uh, uh, leave a review, even if you don't like it. Well, okay, if you don't like it, you don't have to leave a review. But if you like it a lot, then you really have to leave a review. I'm just teasing. Uh, let's see, there's a few questions rolling around out there. Somebody says they want you to answer the washer dryer question again. What was the washer dryer? Can you write it off even if you don't do a cost seg? Yeah, if you buy it. Yeah, you buy it, you got an invoice. Mm -hmm. uh, you're either gonna write it off under the $2,500 rule or you're going to write it off as bonus depreciation. Yep, somebody says, Matt says, is a real estate professional tax differently from an active participant versus just filing as a passive investor? Uh, yes. So here's how it works. If I am a, uh, if I have passive losses from real estate activity or businesses in which I do not materially participate, so I'm a silent partner in a business, but I have basis and it kicks me losses. I can only use passive losses to offset passive income with two exceptions. If I am an active participant in real estate, I can write off up to $25,000 against my ordinary income or capital gains. Here's the big one. That phases out at 100,000 to 150,000. Right. So you start to lose. For every $2, you lose a dollar. Um, otherwise, I need to be a real estate professional. In real estate professional, uh, I don't really want to dive into that when I've done it a million times on this show. I would encourage you to go to our YouTube and check out real estate professional status or come to our events. Uh, but in a nutshell, it's the my, at least one spouse's primary personal activity is real estate in construction, mm -hmm. in development, in being a real estate agent or being involved in the, the sale. And the spousal group with all of your real estate is materially participating. And there's about seven different tests uh, that, that you could qualify under there. You meet those and your passive losses become ordinary. So if one spouse runs a construction company as a realtor, fill in the blank, then your passive losses could end up being used to offset your W-2 income or your other income. So it gets really, really important. And how do you prove your 750 hours? Somebody says, you just document it. You just keep a, uh, I use a phone. You know, I'm not a real estate professional because I, I spend much more time doing tax and lawyering. But if I was uh, running construction or something like that, I would just keep my schedule. And if the IRS gripes, you say, here's my schedule. Here's, here's all my days. Here's what I spent. And as long it has to be 750 hours and more than 50% of your personal services. So, so it has to be more than anything else you're doing. So if you have a part-time job and you're doing a thousand hours as a, uh, as a chef, you have to do a thousand and one hours real estate. Uh, and then you, and then you could qualify first prong. Second prong is materially participating on your real estate. Um, if my business and house are in my revocable living trust when I, oh, we already hit that. Same answer as before. All right. That's good. So maybe I just. Wait, did you skip one? Uh, it's the same one. So those two, I, I must have backed up. Oh, okay. Uh, I understand that I will owe income taxes on the amount of withdrawal from my traditional IRA. Can I use passive activity losses from rental real estate investments to offset this IRA withdrawal income to avoid income taxes? What a timely question. Because we just answered it. We just answered this. Uh, IRA income is ordinary income. It is not passive. So you cannot use your PALS, your passive activity, activity losses to offset your uh, traditional IRA income. Repeat that. You cannot use your passive activity losses to offset your traditional IRA income. Unless? Unless it's uh, you meet the $25,000 exception. Or? Are you a real estate professional? Yes. Isn't that fun? Mm -hmm. So we just answered this one. So 
I'm not going to spend too much time on it. I'm reading all the questions. I get distracted. I see all these good questions. Let's see. We're getting close. Actually, we have two more. I'm thinking like we're a little bit over. This might be the last one. Nope. No, there's one. one. There's one. Okay. Can I buy an investment property before selling a property in a 1031 exchange? Yes, you can. It's called a reverse 1031. Big red lights. You cannot buy the new property yourself. You have to use a qualified intermediary to acquire it. Uh, actually, there's another person you have to use. Uh, exchange something title holder. Yeah, I, I guess it could be the QI. It's the QI, but they're they're taking title in the name of the exchange in, in their in theirs for on your behalf, right. and then you do the exchange when you sell the other property. So as long as you don't touch the money or title, you're good. So here's the hint: make sure that you're going to a 1031 exchange yeah. facilitator to do it. But yes, you can. You could actually build a house. Uh, I believe you have 180 days. So if I acquire a property then I could sell mine. I have 180 days to get it done. Um, there's ways to do it where I'm actually not just acquiring, but I'm doing a construction and mm -hmm. building it. And then I'm doing it. So in the reverse exchange, you just have to uh, sell the other property within 180 days mm -hmm. of your purchase. Uh, and that should take all of 45 minutes to sell that property. Mm -hmm. Very, very good. For a W-2 employee, what do you recommend is the best way to save on tax? Taxes when stock market trading. What do you think, Jeff? Uh, the, the rules will kind of reapply no matter what you're talking about, uh, what kind of income you're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, best way to save on taxes when stock market trading, uh, if you want to hold long term uh, in your trading, uh, you're going to have lower tax rates by holding long term. Uh, if you have a lot of gains, you should consider uh, harvesting uh, losses uh, mm -hmm. to offset your gains. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a couple of good ideas. The, so like it, just in a regular world where you have these things and somehow you have a stock account or you're an employee, so you get you vest a little and maybe you're going to have some capital gains. It's just remember that long-term capital gains can be taxed at 0%, especially like if you're married filing jointly. If you make less than $80,000, your, your long-term capital gain rate is zero. So what Jeff said about the holding period is pay attention to it. Don't just sell something at the end of the year mm -hmm. and say, oh, I think I need to get rid of it. You may wanna look at that and say, wait, if I, if I wait a few weeks, I might not have to pay tax on this. Because if you sell it as short-term, it's just added into your ordinary tax bracket. So you're gonna be paying, what, in that case, 24% plus your state. Um, if, you are, if you have expenses, then the big thing I would say is make sure you're not trading in your individual name. So I would make sure that you, uh, that you are trading through a structure, usually a, a partnership with a corporation uh, in that partnership as a, acting as a uh, manager or a general partner. And the reason that you're doing that is so you can actually, the, the corporation is a mechanism to allow you to take some expenses. Um, if you are lower income, then I would suggest that you do like a Roth IRA and you'll never pay tax ever again on any of the gains in your stock market. And you put the money in there as after tax dollars in a really low tax bracket. And then, you know, hopefully you make $5 million. The guys that did PayPal, not uh, Elon, but the other folks, one of them had done that through a self-directed IRA and they had about 6 million bucks made through the, uh, through the retirement plan or some very large dollar amount which yes, was shielded from tax. So uh, not a bad deal. Um, those are just a few ideas. I think we could sit around all day long and, and conjure more up, but uh, it's kind of fun. Uh, somebody else said, hey, uh, let's see, what if you have, you're a 49% uh, owner in a partnership that sells two properties? Here, I'm gonna go back to uh, the little question and answer thing. Where's my little question and answer? There it is. So that you guys don't have to look at it. What if you're 49% owner in a partnership that sells two properties and the 51% owner doesn't want a 1031 exchange? Can you do that separately? The answer is it's really hard uh, because when you do a 1031 exchange, it has to go the entity name to the entity name. And so if somebody wants out, 
the best thing you do is what's called a swap and drop, where you agree to be purchased and bought out after the 1031 exchange, and that's how you do it. And then you, and then after you 1031 exchange it, then you buy them out of the proceeds and you you keep your 1031 exchange good with that entity, but then you buy them out of their interest. So you're going to have to probably refi the properties after. Um, somebody says, I have two rental properties, A and B. A has suspended passive losses carry over from 2019. In 2020, both A and B have profits. Can B's profits offset uh, A's pass or be offset with A's passive losses? Yeah. So it doesn't matter where the passive income comes from, your passive losses can offset it. So if you're a silent owner in a pizza shop that makes money and you're losing money in real estate, the real estate's going to offset the pizza shop. People are never get that one right because if, if you are a silent owner, you're not materially participating, you're just sitting back. I said, hey, Jeff, you want to go do a pizza shop? Here's some money. I don't want to be involved. That's perfect. Right. And assuming Jeff lights up the world and sells lots and lots of pizza, then that's a great mechanism for me to use up my passive losses. That's a, a lot of investments are driven by that, guys. You'll oftentimes see somebody who says, I'm willing to participate, but I don't want to be involved. What they're saying is, woo, 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 I have passive losses that I need to use. And you're like, oh, okay. Um, hey, if you if you like this sort of stuff, you want to go listen to some of the previous tax Tuesdays. They're some of our most popular events. It's kind of interesting. People like to listen to this. I always think that they're looking for uh, mine food to see if they can save a few dollars or they just like listening to other people's scenarios. Uh, by all means, go to andersonadvisors.com forward slash podcast. The, the link's right there. Uh, you'll see there's a lot of different podcasts. We have all sorts of folks on. It's always fun to, 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 to have conversations with these people. Uh, replays of the Tax Tuesdays are always in your Platinum portal as well. And if you have questions, especially if you had a question that was not answered tonight, that was maybe a longer question, by all means, send them on in to Tax Tuesday at AndersonAdvisors.com. We don't charge for this. Uh, never want to charge for this. This is more fun having conversations with y'all. We always have, you know, four or 500 people on, sometimes a thousand, just depending on what's going on in the world. Uh, but, uh, and then we have lots of thousands of people that, that download and listen to it. It's just always fun to have these conversations and you guys always ask great questions. Um, Christos and Pio and, and, uh, and company, they all do a really great Dana. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be mean and Elliot, they all do a great job and Patty answers questions. So, uh, they're always doing a whole bunch of stuff. Um, did I miss the application for borrowing against your crypto? Uh, email us and we'll get you the, the, the folks that uh, we've had people actually use. So I, I never like talking about stuff that, that we don't have experience with. Uh, I mean, I could just go look it up and say, here's people that say they do it. I'd much rather hear from my clients who said I've had a good experience and we have people that have uh, borrowed. So uh, let us get you that information so that you have a better chance of having success as opposed to somebody who says they can do some things. Um, sweet. That's it. Do you have anything else? I got nothing else. I got nothing. So uh, we'll stay on and answer the questions. There's uh, These guys answered 187 questions in writing. There's about six that are still open. So if you have a question, now's the time to ask it quick and see if we can't get you an answer. And uh, these guys will help you. And I hope you guys are all doing great. Stay safe. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully uh, you guys will have a prosperous next couple of weeks. And we'll see you at the next Tax Tuesday. So thanks, guys. Thank you.